a few verses along with you, beginning in verse number 8, where the Scripture says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, it's so good to be in your house today to worship you on such a special occasion. I thank you for every soul that's here. I thank you, Lord, for the songs we've sung that have been sung. They have blessed my soul. Thank you for the beautiful children who have ministered. Father, I thank you for the scripture. It is really the words by which we live. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless this proclamation and that we would leave here today different people than when we walked in. And I ask this this morning, Father, in faith, for I ask it in the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. You know, there's been some amazing announcements throughout history. One, some of us in the room were not myself, but some of you were old enough to remember this one. War is over. Germany signs truce. I was old enough to remember this great announcement. Heart transplant appears successful. The South African Christian doctor, uh, Dr. Christian Barnard, performed the first human-to-human -human heart transplant in 1967. It was a success. Though the patient died 18 days later, it was not due to the failed uh, transplant it was due to complications. How many of you remember this great announcement? 1969, men walk on moon. Remember that? Astronauts land on plane, collect rocks, plant flags. Voice from moon said the eagle has landed. And I'll never forget this one. This is really one of the most amazing ones I've ever saw. Hillary Clinton adopts alien baby. That was really a mind blower back in the 80s. That, that really kind of blew me away. Secret Service building special nursery in the White House. Built a special nursery in the White House. Space creature survived UFO crash. And uh, that was really an amazing announcement. Ready for one more? This is one that really blew me away. Dick Cheney is a robot. Hallelujah. I, you know, that guy almost had me fooled. But uh, turns out that he goes to the hospital to get his circus rewired, according to the Weekly World News back in the early 2000s. Now, <laughs> those are pretty amazing announcements, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> some are fictitious, some are factual. But what we just read this morning is what I would call the most amazing announcement. The amazing annunciation is what I titled this message. Annunciation is the word that your Bible translators use, which simply means an announcement. And I deem it to be amazing, something that affects in me great wonder, because of the seven reasons I'd like to put before you this morning. And I pray that you'd have an open heart as we review these reasons together, because I believe as we review these reasons together, it can rekindle the awe and revive your appreciation for what Christmas and what Christianity is all about. And I best my prayer for you this morning that this would not just be a secular holiday or just a sentimental one, but something that would be very meaningful to you. And so let's look at some of the reasons why this is an amazing announcement. The first reason has to do with who the Annunciation is made to, in my mind. We saw last week that something really incredible happened in Bethlehem. Luke recorded for us, we read these last week, that God moved Caesar's heart to take a census. It was the first one ever taken, so it was really unprecedented. In order to get people to pay more taxes eventually, and so Joseph and Mary had to go to the town of Bethlehem in order to register for the census. And while they were there, the baby was born. 
she wrapped them in cloths and placed them in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in light of the fact that this was one of the most scripturally significant, one of the most uh, prophetic events in all of history, God makes a decision not to make the announcement to the scribes, who were the ones who were the most learned in the Mosaic law and sacred writings. He makes a decision not to go to the chief priests, which are the priests that held the highest office in Israel. He chose not to go to the Pharisees, those who were considered to be the most pure and separated amongst the Israelites. He chose not to go to the Sadducees, those who also were committed to living a sacred and sanctified and righteous life. But in fact, he went to shepherds, herdsmen. And uh, I find that amazing. Don't you? These people that primarily the Bible speaks about in disparaging terms. In Genesis chapter 46, you've read this before, I'm sure, that when Joseph called his family down to live with him in Egypt, he told them that you make sure you tell Pharaoh that you are herdsmen, that you are shepherds, because shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. They're detestable. And in fact, friends, they were detestable somewhat to the Jews. They were seen as being uncouth and unprincipled because of the fact that they literally tended to the animals that eventually would be sacrificed, that the Egyptians held sacred, the oxen and the sheep, uh, the Jews thought they were unprincipled people because they were Sabbath breakers. Their, the nature of their occupation demanded it. They, they couldn't be um, in the temple. They couldn't uh, rest on the Sabbath. They had to be with those sheep 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Also, they were considered to be unskilled and uneducated people. That's why many times shepherding was reserved for kids. Remember in Samuel's uh, account for Samuel 16, where Jesse comes to... Uh, Samuel comes to Jesse's house and says, God has chosen a king from your, from your children. And uh, he walks before him, eight of the children, and he said, do you have any more? He said, well, we do have the youngest one out tending the sheep. And they were seen as outcasts. They were seen as outlaws. Clark's commentary on the Bible says that shepherds and feeders of cattle were usually a sort of lawless, free-booting bandits, frequently making inroads on villages, etc., carrying off cattle and whatever spoils they could find. They were, they were seen, people that were seen as people of questionable character. That's why even their testimony in a court of law was not considered valid. They were shady people. So why would God make the announcement to shepherds? Well, I believe it was a prophetic and allegoric statement he was making. What was it? Well, remember when Jesus finally entered into his ministry. In Luke chapter 4, the Bible says that he took the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, unrolling it, he, had a, he moved far down that scroll, got down to the 60th chapter, 61st chapter, I'm sorry, and he found the place where it said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery for the sight of the blind, and to release the oppressed. I believe God was making a prophetic statement when he and an allegoric statement when he announced this news to shepherds, which was this, that the gospel is primarily designed for those that are, that are considered outcasts, those that are considered the lowlifes of the world. Has not God chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise? Has not God chosen the weak things of the world to shame the strong? He has chosen the lowly. He has chosen the despised. He has chosen those things to nullify the things that are so that no flesh may boast before him. Friends, that is why Paul was never ashamed to identify himself with that group of people ever, even though he was a former Pharisee. First Timothy says that here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He never had a problem identifying himself as one of those because he realized, friends, that the gospel was designed for such, for the outcasts. And I believe that's why the first announcement of the, of the Christ being born was made to that group of people. And I think we should take a moment and praise God for that right now. I think that's an amazing thing about the gospel. That's always been a source of wonder to me. That's why I am here today doing what I do, because God takes the fools of this world 
and the low lives of this world and gives them this high mantle so that no flesh may boast before him. I praise God for that this morning. And I will always consider myself to be a part of that group, and I pray that you will too. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the second reason I think this is an amazing annunciation is because where, where it was made. It says it was out in a field. A field. Not this kind of field, folks. Uh, Ohio State University field with 110,000 people in a marching band. The announcement wasn't made there. It was made in this kind of field. What's up with that? Now, if I was Jesus' PR man, I wouldn't have made the announcement there. Would you? I would have maybe gone to the temple on a holy day when millions of Jews were infiltrating Jerusalem for some sacred occasion, and I would have probably stood on top of that wall there and proclaimed, the king is here. But that's not how God did it. He didn't choose to do it, say, in the Roman forum where, where all of the, the business of Rome would transpire. This was the place where speeches were made. This was the place where trials were held. This was the place where triumphant processions took forth. This was the place where uh, gladi gladiators had, had, uh, had uh, fights and so forth. This was the place that was even a place of commerce, a place of government, a place where the citizens of Rome would gather frequently. He chose, he could have chose to have the announcement made there, but he didn't. Or maybe Caesar's palace. I'm sorry, the, the Roman Colosseum, or maybe even Caesar's palace. This is the ruins of Caesar's palace. This is one man's place. That's, obviously there was no picture of it taken in his heyday, but this is where we get the idea in Vegas for this. It was quite an extravagant thing. God chose not to make that announcement in any of those places. In fact, he chose to make it here. Now, I ask you why. I find that to be a, a, something that astonishes me. Why is that? Again, I believe God was making a prophetic and allegoric statement to the world. What was it? Jesus was essentially saying this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for whom? For what? For the sheep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you see, Jesus talked about the gospel in these terms in Luke 15. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country, the open field, and go after that lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and he goes home and he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And I think God was making a statement to the world. I have come to seek and save that which is lost. Praise the Lord. And that's why he went to a field. Now the third reason I find astounding too. Where it was made. Or when it was made. Scripture says he went to his flocks he went to shepherds who were keeping watch over their flocks at night. Probably looks something like this. Or actually, there should be a shepherd in the picture. It looks something like that, maybe. And that's a Van Gogh, if you're an art enthusiast. Why at night? Why not in the daytime? Why not when the sun's out and the crowds are moving about? Why at night? Well, I think the King James Version of verse 8 gives us a little light. It says that the shepherds were abiding in the fields, keeping their watch over their flock by night, which means they lived there. They lived in the fields. Clark's commentary in the Bible reminds us that they dwelt in the fields where they had their sheep penned up. And they undoubtedly had tents and booths in which they lived. This is how these, these guys lived. And Keeping their watch by night meant they would take three-hour intervals, turns, watching over the sheep. Why was that? Because the sheep were prey to wolves and foxes and bandits and so forth that were infesting that particular land. Again, okay, why at night? 
I believe it's a prophetic allegoric statement. What is it? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You know, when those sheep were penned up in the middle of the field, they would sometimes, if they got far from maybe a, an established pen, and the sheep would have to graze a little further out, and, and the shepherds would have to take them a little further than normal, sometimes they'd have to make a makeshift pen. They'd have to find rocks. They'd have to find uh, branches, anything they could find. And they would pen up those sheep, and when Jesus said the, leper, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, that's what these men literally did. They would lay at the gate of the pen. They would be the door. See, that's where Jesus was getting these ideas from this kind of terminology when he would say, I, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Who, all who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pastors. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I believe Jesus was speaking about the fact that this is the kind of shepherd he would be. Again, I believe it was an allegoric statement. My sheep listen to him. And I think it speaks of the, the security we have in Christ. I don't have this scripture, but John 10 tells us, verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Why? Because I am the gate to the sheep. To the sheep. I am the gate to the sheepfold. If anyone's going to get to them, they're going to have to go through me. And that's impossible, isn't it? <laughs> No one can take them out of my hand, for I and the Father are one, and no one can take them out of my Father's hand. Praise God. I believe it also was saying this, folks. It was a prophetic statement. The people walking in darkness had seen a great light. Here's where these shepherds, out at night, watching their sheep, and prophetically, Isaiah says, the people saw walking in darkness, saw a great light. What was the great light? Same chapter, a few verses down. For us, to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the light. That's what Jesus meant by, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Hallelujah. J.C. Rell has a wonderful thought on this. He says, you know, why did he come at night? It was a time perfectly suited for the introduction of the gospel. The whole civilized world was at length governed by one master, Caesar. The princes and priests of the non-Jewish world had been weighed in the balances and found lacking. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome had all successfully proven that the world through its wisdom did not know God, 1 Corinthians 1.21. Even with all their mighty conquerors, poets, historians, architects, philosophers, the kingdoms of the world were full of dark idolatry. It was indeed a dark time and a due time for God to interpose from heaven and send down an almighty Savior. It was due time. It was night time. It was the right time for Christ to be born. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo, I like that, friend. Well, what's the fourth reason? I'm amazed regarding who the Annunciation is made by. An angel of the Lord. An angel of the Lord. Clark's commentary uh, points out the fact that he probably stood over them. It's likely that the angel appeared to them in the air. Could you imagine an angel like just out there in the air standing over you? And from him the rays of the glory of the Lord shone around about them as the rays of light are projected from the sun and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The kabod, the visible splendor of God. Whoo, hallelujah. Now friends, the Bible tells us that God doesn't have physicality. He is spirit. John also said that God is light. How would he know that? Well, there was one occasion when he and Peter and James went up on a mountain with Jesus and he became transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so what they saw that day was, this is not a word that's actually in biblical literature. This is a word that 
been somehow, the idea has been transliterated into English thought. We use this word Shekinah. That's actually Latin. That's not Greek. But what they saw was the shining, glorious, visible presence of God. <laughs> I think that's amazing, folks. Don't you? They saw the presence of God. A presence that is blinding. When Paul saw it on the Damascus Road, he couldn't see for three days. I suppose that's why Paul says, when you're talking about God, he's a being who lives in an unapproachable light, whom no one can see. Because if you get even a glimpse of his glory, you're blind. He lives in a light, as Barnes notes on the Bible says, that is so brilliant, so dazzling, mortal eyes cannot endure it. And I think that's an amazing thing. So, the fifth reason, I think, and, and the Bible says that they, they were obviously terrified. Here's an angel up in space, you know, kind of maybe 20, 30 feet off the ground, and he's, and he's shining, and these shepherds are out at night, these lowlifes, these outcasts, these un ignorant, unlearned, uneducated men. They're there, and the angel of the Lord appears to them, and they're scared. But I think the fifth reason this is such an amazing enunciation is why it's made. They say to him, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. <laughs> That'll be for all the people. Even you. Now, even you. You know, folks, um, I don't know what it is, but every time I, I read this, I think of the three stooges. Where, where's that coming from, right? Should I take authority over it or what? I think, I think of these, you know, I think of these, um, these, Kind of simple guys, right? And uh, and they're looking up and good news. You know, Curly Joe maybe Curly says, "Good news? Huh? What is it? Right? Good news for all the people. Oh, we lost our. Uh... Oh, you're getting ready there, huh, Tammy? Okay. Uh, now I need to go back to the PowerPoint for a second, Tam. We have a treat for you this morning. You guys ready for this? Never, always a new beginning. We always have special things, right? Are we there? PowerPoint? Okay. Okay. Yeah, here we go. For every class and character of people. Here's the sixth reason why it's an amazing enunciation. It has to do with the what, what it is. We just Okay, you got good news. What is it? Got good news. I like good news. You like good news? Hey, the angel goes, hey, hey, look, guys. There's an angel hanging out in space, shining brilliant like the sun. He's telling us not to be afraid because he's got good news for us. Well, what is it? Today, something happened in the town of David. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's a prophetically significant place. That's a historically significant place. Uh, what is it? A Savior has been born to you. A Savior. A Savior. Did you hear that, guys? Tammy, now I need your help. A Savior. A Savior has been born. So these guys are really excited about the fact that a Savior has been born. Right? A Savior. And Larry, Curly, and Mo are really excited about the fact that a Savior has been born. Hallelujah. A Savior. A Savior. Help me out here, would you, Vanessa? Help me out. A Savior has been born. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. A Savior. A Savior. Isn't that great? Dennis. A Savior. Hey, a Savior has been born. Praise God. A Savior. Amen. A Savior has been born. Hey, that's good news. Yeah, a Savior has been born. One more time. That's good news. The Savior's been born. Praise God. Michael, praise God. The Savior's been born. Praise the Lord. The Savior's been born, everybody. Hey, the Savior's been born. That's wonderful. That's awesome. That's marvelous. Oh, that's so good. The Savior's been born. Praise the Lord. The Savior's been born. Yeah, one more time. 
That's awesome. That's tremendous. That's great. Oh, that's incredible. That's, that's, that's great news. That's wonderful news. Hallelujah. That's great. Hallelujah. Savior's been born. Isn't that great? But, uh, uh, hey, angel. Savior's been born, guys. Did you hear that? Uh, ask him. Ask him, Mo. Wh wh what does he save us from? These lousy shepherding jobs, right? I hate this job. This is a terrible job. This is a low-paying job. You're going to save me from this job. You're going to get me a really good job. Is that where I'm going to be safe from? No. Huh. Huh. I know where you're going to save us from. This low social status. I'm tired of being the tail and not the head. I'm tired of people looking down on me because I've got this terrible position. You're going to exalt me and give me a great position in society, right? No. My poverty. Hey, there's somebody who's come to save me from my poverty. Hallelujah. Oh, this is great. I'm going to be driving a Cadillac soon. Right, Angel? Nope. Uh, uh, well, uh, from my unfulfilled love life? I mean, it's hard to get a date when you're a shepherd. You know what I'm saying? You smell like goats. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a ladies' man now, right? I'm going to have a great love life. That's what you came to save us from, right? That's what he came to save us from, right? No. Ah, my flat feet, you know, walking around all the time, chasing these little sheep down. Oh, I can't find arches in this era. You know, we're just before the arch was invented, and I'll tell you, my feet hurt all the time. At least he's going to do that for me, isn't he? Nope. What gives? Angel, what's he going to save me from? Your sins. What do I need to save for my sins for? Yep, yep, yep. Well, see, the wages of sin is death. What do you mean by that? Well, thanatos. When your soul leaves your body, the implied idea here is your soul is going to go to a future place of misery called hell. And what Jesus came to save you from was from hell. From the miserable state of the wicked, dead, in hell. Huh. A wise guy, eh? Yeah. He's come to save you from your sin. To save you from this. See, there was a beggar who died and a rich man who died. His body was buried, but look where his soul was in hell. Tormented. And he came to save you from that. to a place that was originally prepared for the devil and his demons. Well, how are you going to do that, angel? Well, you see, he's got another name. He's the Christ. He's the Christ. What do you mean by that? He's the Son of God who died for your sins according to the Scriptures. And... He's got another title called Lord, which is 
Yehovah in the Hebrew. It's the proper name of the one true God. Lord, Kyrios, is another name given in the Greek for Messiah. You see, God became a man for a very, very specific purpose. And it was this, Philippians 4, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing for a reason. And he took the very nature of a servant for a reason. And he was made in human likeness for a reason. And he was found in the appearance of a man for a reason. So that he could die on a cross. So that he could humble himself and be obedient to death, even death on the cross. He was, he died for our sins according to the scripture. And he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. So, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's, why, that's how he can save you, because this Jesus is both Christ and Lord. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death. And he can bring you into a perfect state. A place called heaven. And if you, if it's Christianity, is, this is Christianity. Jesus is Lord. That's it. You can boil down Christianity to those three words. Jesus is Lord. And if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you'll believe in your heart that he died for the sins according to the Scripture, that he was raised to life according to the Scripture, that he was raptured to the Father's right hand according to the Scripture, you will be saved. You'll be saved. Whew. Saved. Sozo. From the wrath of God to be executed upon the ungodly at the close of this age. From the eternal doom that is coming at the second coming of Christ. You could be saved from that. You may not get the girl you want. You may not get the job you want. But oh friends, there's a place that will be prepared for you that you can't even imagine. You, you can't even want it. It's, too, it's beyond wanting in these mortal bodies. We can't even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. That's what he saves you from. Well said, angel. Here, here, here. I'm afraid some people in this room are not safe from that. But you can't be. I got tomorrow. You sure? 20 kids went to school a week ago Friday. They didn't have tomorrow, did they? So you need a light moment before you lay on the heavy stuff here, right? And anyway, this is the last reason why this is an awesome, awesome announcement, man. This is amazing. First, the, the angel said, now this will be a sign unto you knuckleheads. In other words, start looking for this kid. It'll, this will be a sign. You heard what he said. This will be a sign. Doink, doink, right? You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths. That's nothing unusual. I mean, that's what they did in that culture. You take a kid and you wrap him in cloths. But here's what's really weird. You'll find him in a manger, in a feeding trough. Uh, what's up with that, angel? Here, here. Feeding trough? Again, it's a prophetic, allegoric statement God is making. What's that? I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. <laughs> friends, you may not get what you want of this world's goods, but I tell you one thing you'll get that is better than this world's goods. You'll get the peace of God abiding in your soul. And you can't buy it. You can't drink it. You can't snort it. You can't entertain your way into it. It's something that comes on the heels of your authentic salvation. The peace of God. I tell you what, friends, I don't have a lot of this world's goods, but one thing I do have is God's peace in my life. I have the peace of God because I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. So, 
you know, this is what, uh, and bread it doesn't can mean any kind of food. Artos. So, lastly, this is what's amazing, how the announcement was made. They, you know, this was too good for just a preacher. They had to have a choir show up. Hallelujah. Some occasions just mandate a choir. Wouldn't you agree? Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with an angel, which means a murion, which means too many to count. Innumerable angels. They just show up on the scene, zap, just like that, suddenly, out of nowhere, apparently. They show up. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then these guys are like, whoa, what's this? What's this? And they're all over the place. They lit up that night sky. I'll guarantee it. And this time, we talked about it before, there are times in the scripture where it says that Mary's song was a song, but she was speaking scripture. But I know on this occasion, these guys were singing. How do you know? Because Job's account says, when God created the world, look at this, when God created the world, the morning stars sang and the angels shouted for joy. You know, maybe they were rapping. What do you think, Mark? They were rapping, maybe. But because it says the angels, they, they, they were praising God, and they said something. I don't know how it went, but it was awesome. What were they saying? Glory to God in the highest. You know, friends, the Christmas story is not man's story. It's God's story. It's God's story. Praise be to God, honor be to God in the highest strains, in the highest possible manner. Why is that? Because the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world has come. Mary had a little lamb who lived before his birth. Self-existent Son of God from heaven he came to earth. Micah 5, 2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Mary had a little lamb. See him in yonder stall. Virgin born, Son of God, to save men from the fall. Therefore, Isaiah 7, 14 says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child. You will give him, you will give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. Mary had a little lamb, obedient son of God. Everywhere the father led, his feet were sure to prod, trod. I have come to, from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Mary had a little lamb crucified on a tree. The rejected son of God, he died to set men free. For you were not redeemed with perishable things such as silver or gold, but you were redeemed with, redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Mary had a little lamb. Men placed him in the grave thinking they were done with him. To death he was no slave. The angel said to the woman, Matthew 28, 5, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Mary had a little lamb. Ascended now is he. All work on earth is ended, our advocate to be. We do not have a great high priest who is unsympathetic to our weaknesses. But we have one who is tempted at every point just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. That we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Mary had a little lamb. Mystery to behold. From the land of Calvary, a lion will unfold. Revelation 5.5. 5, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. When the day star comes again, of this be very sure, it won't be lamb-like silence, but with a lion's roar. I saw heaven open. Before me there was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. 
and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. This is his second coming. First time he came humbly as a baby. This is the way he's coming the next time. And friends, he's coming. He's coming. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? You can be. You can be. How? Well, see, he has goodwill towards men. That's why he sent his son. He has goodwill towards men. But unless you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be trampled upon and not saved. Jim, if you come to the piano, please. I'd like to ask you to stand with me at this time. And I'd like to ask you to consider something with me for today. And it's this. Friends, God wants to give you a present for Christmas. <laughs> he wants to give you a present. Really? Yeah, God wants to give you a present. Is it uh, an Xbox? No. Is it a new pair of shoes? No. He wants to give you something. What is it? It's called peace. Peace. The peace of his salvation. Explain it to me. I'd be delighted. See, it's peace with God. Romans 5.1. It's the peace of God. Philippians 4.7. It's peace within yourself. Peace within yourself. As the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. It's peace with others. See, once you find peace with God and peace within yourself, you can live at peace with others. Ephesians 2 talks about it. How do you get this kind of peace? Well, look, look what the shepherds did. They said, let's go. Okay. Again, here, you know, you heard what the guy said. What's the matter with you? Ding. He said, look for a baby lying in a manger. Let's go, Mo. Right? He takes off. And he didn't give them a whole lot of detail. He just said, you'll find a baby wrapped in the manger. And they saw the child. And something clicked. Maybe today for the first time you're seeing it. Maybe. You're understanding that the only way you can be saved from hell, friends, hell is a real place, is you make peace with God through Jesus Christ. Real peace. Not suedo peace. Real peace. Supernatural peace. How do you do that? Well, they, as it were, they looked into the gospel claims and saw it was real. Yeah, it's real. Now, don't be offended. They could have said, a baby in a manger, I'm out of here. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of package is salvation coming in a baby in a manger? They, you know, friends, don't be afraid at the, at, the, at the container today. Don't be offended at me. I'm just a messenger boy. I'm just a FedEx driver. I'm just delivering a package today. Don't, get, don't look at me like you hate me. I'm just telling you the truth. Jesus saves. God told these guys through an angel. He's telling you today through me. Well, you know, go figure. And he'll save you. <laughs>